Hello and welcome to RGU Talk, the official podcast of Robert Gordon University. I'm your host, Johnny Milne, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined this week by a man who wears many hats, both across the university and across the region, Director of Planning and Policy Development at RGU, Dr. Duncan Coburn. Duncan, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, I mentioned that you wear many hats, and not to put too fine a point in it, but you really are involved in an impressive number of things um, outside of your remit as Director of Planning and Policy Development. I mean, can you name a few and uh, ones that are certainly, as I say, outside of your remit? Uh, well, I suppose in, I, I, I suppose in part you're referring to uh, being the uh, equality champion for sexual orientation. Uh, perhaps also you're referring to my involvement in the Look Again uh, Visual Arts and Design Festival. And I suppose through that bit, uh, my other wider engagement within the culture sector in Aberdeen. Uh, so um, a sound board, um, I'm on a board member of the Sound Festival, uh, board member of Aberdeen Performing Arts, uh, and I chair the culture network for the city. And how do you how do you fit all that in? Um, well, I'm a firm believer that um, as someone who has no children, then I have an awful lot of time to give back to the community. And that community for me is as much the workplace as it is uh, the city in which I uh, live in. Uh, and that probably explains why it is I'm, I'm willing to give up some time to get involved in these activities. Um, well, the one activity we're particularly here to speak about today is, as you mentioned, your role as equality champion at RGU um, and what it's like to be out and proud throughout university life. Uh, first of all, can you explain what an equality champion does? Well, the purpose of an equality champion is to really champion uh, one of the protected characteristics. So in my case, sexual orientation, uh, but there are equality champions uh, from uh, the staff and indeed from students uh, on campus for uh, the other protected uh, uh, characteristics. So gender, age, disability, uh, religion and belief uh, and ethnicity. And how did you come to be named a quality champion for sexual orientation? Uh, well, a previous vice principal who, who was then convening the Equality and Diversity Advisory Group uh, asked me. Uh, the first equality champion had been uh, Brian Webster, who was then the uh, head of the School of uh, Nursing and Midwifery. And when he left, um, I was asked. And had you been involved with um, networks or anything like that beforehand? Uh, no, uh, at the time I was a board member of a charity, uh, Gay Men's Health in Scotland, uh, and so I, I, suspo I suspect actually that that was one of the reasons. And for those that are wondering and might not be too sure, what support, what networks are available for staff at RGU or students that are LGBT? I suppose it's a good question. Uh, in the last uh, two or three years, uh, a group of staff at the university has set up a staff network for LGBT uh, staff and uh, the student society, the LGBT plus society, has been uh, active society or relatively act active society uh, for over a decade now. Uh, I think these networks, the the society, they're very important for individuals, and I think actually um, the staff network in particular, I think, demonstrated that there were a large number of staff in the university who had actually, until they came to a staff network meeting, had never actually come out to any of their work colleagues. And I think what's actually particularly um, pleasing about uh, one of the things of the staff network is that most of those individuals have uh, now um, have now come out with it. To their work colleagues. They are better able, I suppose, to be who they are in the workplace. And I think that's one of the most important things that networks like that can bring to people. Um, none of us should ever come to work um, and hide behind a mask. Mm -hmm. um, we should come to work, and I'm a firm believer that people who come to work who want to contribute the most uh, need to also share something about themselves. Uh, and when we hide things about ourselves, we probably hamper our own performance. And speaking, you know, following that, um, it is very likely that there will be staff or students of RGU who will be listening to this who may be LGBT, but perhaps don't feel comfortable with it. They've not had the kind of experience you've just spoken about. If you don't mind, what was your own experience like coming out to your colleagues? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that people um, often make the mistake that you come out once. Um, and actually, when you come out, you 
make that mistake as well. Mm. You think, well, I've come out, so I that's it done. If you have to come out on a series of occasions, in fact, every time you meet a new person, you have to assess whether or not actually uh, you're going to correct the assumption that you are married uh, to someone of the opposite sex or that you have uh, children uh, with someone from the opposite sex. Uh, and of course, sometimes uh it's you know it's not important and other times it is important and I suppose everybody has to select a time I suppose if they want to um, when they have that conversation with people um, I did uh, within about mm, three four weeks of starting work mm -hmm. uh, and yes it's a very nervous thing to do um, I was then the principal's policy advisor uh, and actually, uh, the person I came out to uh, first was uh, Amber Price, who now uh, is the Deputy Principal's Project Officer and, and PA. And um, it was a nerve-wracking experience. Uh, it can be a very daunting experience to share something very personal about yourself, which is actually on one level very important, because you don't really want people to... Um, go around assuming you have a girlfriend or in my case a female partner or a wife um you want to be able to talk about the things that you get up to in the evening or uh, at the weekend and that is all always uh, for a lot of people going to involve uh, their nearest and dearest and you know, as, as you say your know, people do kind of make that assumption you yourself wear a wedding ring um do you find that people even people that have known you for a while just assume your partner's gender and how, how do you usually respond to that well i, I suppose uh, i'll just uh, correct you if i may uh, it's not a wedding ring it's a civil partnership ring i do apologize uh, and uh, i suppose that's uh, that's uh, i suppose another interesting um interesting element i suppose mm. of assumptions that are made and of course in life we all make assumptions you made an assumption just there which was incorrect and that's ha that happens all the time the, the i think uh, the skill is to know when to challenge that how to challenge it appropriately hope i hope i've just done so just now uh, one of the reasons i do that though is because um i think people assume that uh if you are um a gay man or a lesbian woman uh then you will uh, now get married whereas actually in scotland uh, uh gay men and women can still get civilly partnered mm -hmm. uh, i and my partner my partner and i um very consciously chose to have a civil partnership uh, for various reasons uh, and one day in the future we may very well get married um, and I suppose the conversation we're having right now is the type of conversation that some people wouldn't be confident to have mm -hmm. in the workplace um, and I think that's a shame it's a shame when we can't talk about who we are and what goes on in our in our life and some people say well that's a private life that's none of uh, my business and uh, well I mean and I think we all have to reflect upon how much we share about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mind people asking me apparently impertinent questions about my partner. My partner is a huge part of my life. Um, so there we go. Well, back in February, um, people and organizations across all of the UK, RGU not being different, celebrated LGBT History Month. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit about what that month means to uh, members of the LGBT plus community? Uh, well, I think, the, the, if I may be irreverent for a moment, the LGBT plus community are exceptionally good at uh, declaring lots of different days for all the different letters that it has in its uh, an acronym. But LGBT History Month is uh, takes place in February every year, uh, and it's an opportunity, I suppose, to demonstrate that um, element of invisibility uh, that exists uh, within someone's, in inverted commas, private life. Uh, it's something that is not necessarily visible. Uh, that's why people have to come out. Uh, and the History Month uh, aims to say, well, just as that happens now in the present, uh, that has happened um, throughout history. Uh, and that uh, sexuality has been something that is uh, invisible uh, in our record of history. It's invisible sometimes in contemporary history, really quite recent um, activities going back to say as recently as even the 80s. Um, and the History Month attempts to, I suppose, celebrate the fact that um, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, they're not something new that has popped out of the woodwork uh, since um, since 1981 in Scotland uh, when consenting um, activities between men were legalized. Um, it's happened throughout history. And um, men have loved other men, women have loved other women. And we tend to, we tend to forget that. 
And um, for LGBT History Month, can you give a couple of examples of events that were taking place here at the university? So each year the uh, History Month has a theme, and this year's theme was something along the lines of uh, language and culture. Uh, and so uh, some of the things we have done is explore, I suppose, um, different cultures and how uh, LGBT uh, rights are, are present in different countries. Uh, we are a community that is very uh, wide in the sense that uh, many of our staff students come from uh, countries outside uh, the UK. And uh, each of those countries or many of those countries have very different attitudes uh, and laws around uh, LGBT equality. So some of what we did was highlighting that through an exhibition in the library. Um, the library also highlighted some of the other LGBT resources that they have available to staff and students. And I suppose one of the final events that we held on campus was a coffee with uh, the LGBT staff network and a straight allies. And a straight ally um, is someone who... Uh, well, we have many of them on campus, actually. A straight ally at a very simple level is probably someone who uh, is wearing a rainbow lanyard at the moment, someone who's willing to show their support for the LGBT, commu LGBT community um, and stand up against some of the discrimination that uh, may or may perceive to take place on campus. Well, speaking of the rainbow colour lanyards, I mean, I'm wearing one myself. They were created by the LGBT plus staff network. When you see people going around campus wearing them, what does that mean to you, either personally or in your role as a quality champion? I think it goes back to what I was talking about, about visibility and invisibility. Um, it's a very simple way in which we can recognize that there are LGBT staff and students, people who use the campus. Uh, and I think that it just allows, going back to one of your earlier questions, uh, as a member of staff here, uh, who's uh, started recently or a student who's just enrolled, it just allows those individuals to feel more accepted, more included, and possibly, hopefully, more able to share parts of their life that they might otherwise be nervous, worried, or less inclined to do so. And in your mind, as a final question, do you think there is any other ways that staff and students, even even alumni, can show their support going forward, regardless of their orientation? Yes. I think there are probably two issues. If you look at uh, the student experience questionnaire that is undertaken at the university every mm -hmm. year, uh, we ask a series of uh, questions, uh, one of which culminates in, overall, how satisfied are you with your learning experience, or words to the effect. And uh, each year, the Equality and Diversity Advisory Group, they monitor uh, a lot of data. One of the items of data they monitor is this questionnaire. And they look at that through the prism of different equality strands. Uh, we happen to monitor on a confidential basis, an anonymized basis, uh, for these purposes, the sexual orientation of our students based on self-declaration. And what is quite uh, pronounced, I think, and has been pronounced for a number of years, has been the relative dissatisfaction of the LGBT student community compared with uh, the straight or heterosexual uh, community. And I'm, it's not a terribly sexy issue. Um, it's not um, the most pressing issue. It only affects uh, hundreds of students, uh, as opposed to looking at other prisms uh, like disability that maybe affects a couple of thousand of students or gender that affects, you know, half the student population, mm -hmm. uh, in essence. Although, so I, I do think we, we need to consider whether or not actually we are supportive of all students and all protected characteristics. And perhaps there are good reasons why LGBT students are not necessarily as satisfied as their heterosexual counterparts. I'm not sure we fully understand that. I think that's something that we would like to understand more. So I think that people in the community should be aware of that. They should be thinking through, well, is there more that we can do to support potentially vulnerable individuals? We know that uh, LGBT uh, individuals, particularly when they're young, uh, between the ages of uh, 16 and 25, are more likely to have mental health issues. They are more likely to attempt suicide uh, than their heterosexual peers. Uh, so there are a range of issues perhaps associated with coming out 
perhaps associated with a perceived inv invisibility about who they are, um, that actually we are at the fulcrum of uh, in a university setting uh, where the vast majority of our undergraduates are of that age as well. When we think about the dedicated support services that exist for other strands, and I'm not criticizing their existence, they definitely need to exist, we maybe need to wonder whether there is more that we can do f than just having a staff network and a student society in this regard. So I think that's one thing, that's a very long-winded one thing. And I think one of the things that might aid that sense of visibility um, is to consider actually the visibility of all objects in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine wearing a rainbow lanyard, it's fine having events to celebrate LGBT History Month, um, but we are a university that is training, in many cases, the professionals of tomorrow, um, and those professionals will have to deal with a wide variety of individuals in their working lives, and indeed in their social lives. And I think we have an obligation to ensure that those individuals, when they move into, say, the finance industry or nursing and midwifery, for example, or the other health care providers, uh, know about the communities that they will work with. And I'm not always certain that we consider how we don't just embed the consideration of equalities, but actually embed equalities issues into the curriculum. How do we, I mean, just as there's been a campaign uh, in the last 10 years uh, that uh, the National Year of Students is really spearheaded around um, is my curriculum black? I think there are questions that we should ask ourselves as a university about, well, how much does my curriculum mention sexual orientation? Mm -hmm. And on there will on occasions be times when that's ridiculous. It, it doesn't fit the curriculum that we teach. But as a modern university that is um, allied, as I say, to the professions, actually those times are probably more frequent than uh, we are we are possibly willing to acknowledge at the moment. Well, Duncan Goburn, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It's been fun. And thank you everyone for listening to another episode of RGU Talk. On behalf of the university, I've been Johnny Milne, and we'll talk to you later. <laughs>